Good evening and good morning wherever you are in the art world. Tonight, the art talks are delighted to have um, to to welcome you in this art talk on uh, cultural diplomacy. A tricky business most of the times. However, this talk will be not only enhancing a framework for cooperation and exchange of exhibition, but most of all on creating awareness on how art is a powerful language to educate and inspire communities. So, and um, we have extraordinary uh, global philanthropists such as Ed Vasser, Jeremy Alamazzani, um, hi, Isumu, <laughs> Hello. and Joanna Kuzmani uh, Koraviev Suo, and Olivier Arifon, and um, hopefully Lisa Russell. So, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Art Talks. Good evening, sir. So, I hope, please, uh, if you can mute uh, all, uh, all the other uh, audience, um, it would be fantastic and um, sorry I'm, I'm admitting everyone here and um, I, I would like to uh, to welcome Ed Van Sell, which is an extraordinary international artist from uh, she lives in Paris and uh, she has dedicated her life to bring peace to her touching powerful poetic works, artworks, which reflect on some very dramatic um, periods of our time. Her sculptures, her uh, paintings, her tapestries and jewelry speak about hope, peace, empathy and love. Wonderful, simple emotions, often overshadowed by human uh, fragility. Welcome, Hedva. Good Thank evening. You. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Carolina, to to invite me and to participate in this wonderful webinar. So um, it's, it's amazing that you were beginning to speak about dramatic sculptures, because today, you know, I missed a Zoom with UNESCO. You know, I'm, I'm Goodwill Ambassador for Cultural Diplomacy at UNESCO. And yes. today, it, today is the, the Holocaust Day. So uh, in the same time, so I said, I'm sorry, I cannot participate. And talking about dramatic, I just will talk two minutes because you were beginning. Of to course. Talk about it. And, and you can see behind me, because I didn't, I didn't meant to speak about yeah. it, but I created, uh, I created a garden in Krakow, which uh, is telling the story of tragedy, of, uh, uh, of, Holoco of the Holocaust, and also um, the uh, four sculptures they, they're beginning with the tearing, explosion, rupture with hope. And the last one is uh, hope. The last sculpture is hope. So this is a thing interesting for today. And it was, it really, uh, uh, it's something who reflect our day today. So thank you to giving me the opportunity to speak about my garden. I wouldn't talk about it. This garden is giving also the symbol for other tragedies for other, other countries in, uh, uh, that had the same, the same history, not really in the same history that it can be, but similar. And uh, it to give, you know, the most important thing in life, it's to give hope that I'm doing through my work. And I will speak a, a little bit now uh, about my work uh, at UNESCO and about cultural diplomacy. Over the past few years, the concept of culture diplomacy has taken root through the basic concept of using the art to advance intercultural dialogue. It is not something new. In fact, it has been at the heart of UNESCO's work from the earliest days. UNESCO work within the United Nations system aims to build bridges between people and countries through exchanges of expression in culture, science, and education. This exceptional UNESCO initiative intends to bring into reality the organization's mandate to build peace through art, with governments around the world finally coming to understand the benefit of bringing art and culture into diplomacy 
it is now that we can see more focused and structured use of art in the context of an inter international relations. Over the past few years, the, the idea of soft power through cultural diplomacy has helped define how the arts, education, sports, music, dance, and intercultural exchanges, among other tools, can be used in the furtherance of nations' foreign policy. Culture is a set of value and practices that creates meaning for society. For me, the use of art to transmit values and messages is something that comes from the heart. Today, I would like to talk to you about few projects that I'm working on, each of which I hope is designed to further or shared goals of building peace throughout. First, of course, there is the art camp, which I'm very honored to be the godmother since 2012. The concept of art camp is simple and it's true example of culture diplomacy. It brings together artists from, country, from countries in conflict. They are working together every two years in Andorra. This concept uh, was developed with the Commission of UNESCO of Andorra. And uh, we are working very, very hard to bring artists and, and to show how working together in, in the period of 10 days bringing them to, to build bridges for peace. And this really a concept which is working very well. I can see afterwards the artists are communicating between them. Uh, during the period of outcome, they're talking about the area. So this is another communication. They are cooking together, each one of the area, of their area. And you can see people from Asia, which have the same food or from Arab countries. And every time they're sharing it with the others, it's, um, it's like a club. And it's like a, it's a project that is so well that uh, even uh, we, we are going to export it to many continents. And I'm very, very proud to say that Malta adopted also this project for the Mediterranean country. You can see countries from the Mediterranean, the same, uh, the same uh, working together, the artists uh, and bringing, you know, uh, dialogue, uh, dialogue for peace. And it's a real, uh, it's interface dialogue and inter and uh, it's a real project that uh, um, works to build peace through, through art. It works so well, I'm telling you again, that I'm in, in two months, we decided to do it in United Arab Emirates in Ajaman, the University of Ajaman. And that I'm going to do next March, it's new, 20, uh, 2022. We're preparing now all the artists from Arab countries, which are going to participate in this project. This project will do also in African countries, and it might be in Tunisia or in Ghana. For, for Africa, and uh, we will work also in um, and the countries like Uzbekistan, um, uh, Kazakhstan, and all this area also. It might be in Azerbaijan for all these artists in July, for all these artists from this area. We did it also in Philippines. It was during a festival of cultural diplomacy. It was, uh, it was uh, in December, and the artists it was different because the artists were working in one big painting, four of them. And uh, they're all about the subject, about peace, about the COVID. So they really they experience themselves about the problems, about the problems as COVID this time and, and the future, as we did also at uh, UNESCO, we were working with artists about resilient art, working in the period of COVID, how art can help in this period, it was a very important ex exercise for this uh, for our for my artists from Art Camp. And there's another project. Well, this is the project that is a really 
very, very working well. And it's, a, it's an example, it's an amazing example for cultural diplomacy. It's helping also the ambassadors that intervening, that they are taking part of, uh, with the artists because you're having exchange between the ambassadors, the commission, the commission of UNESCO from all over the world. And it's a big exchange. And uh, we're showing the work of the artists every two years uh, in, a, in important places like United Nations. I exposed my artists uh, twice at United Nations. Uh, and then also the Parliament European uh, in uh, many, many places with uh, the with value, which helps the artist. So, so this is about outcome. There's another project. There's another project with, I was beginning to talk about my art. I'm saying that my bronze are delivering a message. And I was talking, I was just beginning to talk about the history, the history, the tragedy, but all this brought me to think about peace. And it's a years that I'm working about a sculpture, uh, which the name is the Tree of Peace. Tree, the Tree of Peace, it's a sculpture that uh, is a real dialogue for, it's a real dialogue. Why? Because the branches of the sculptures that are representing three religious. The branches representing, they are holding hands and asking, you know, to connect people. So it's a connecting sculpture. It's a dialogue inter interface, intercultural dialogue, the sculpture. And this sculpture also, it's uh, taking care, you know, about, about the nature, about the biodiversity and telling the people, well, you have to be careful. Uh, nature is something which is important, the deforestation, all the problems that we have today. So the sculpture, the Tree of Peace, I was beginning to work about uh, this concept in 2007. The first one, it was at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. This one is in Andorra. In the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, you can see here. The second one is at uh, Arizona. Uh, Temple University in Philadelphia. I'm very proud to say that I have also uh, in West Jerusalem, but I have also in Palestine, in uh, East Jerusalem. Uh, when I have, it's not East Jerusalem, it's on the way to Ramallah. I have also at El Quds University, this, um, this sculpture. Uh, in Malta, you can see it on the left. In Malta, uh, it's all, it was celebrating the end of the Cold War signed in 89 between President Bush and Gorbachev uh, at the University of Harvard. Uh, at uh, Berlin, down Berlin, it's for the 50 years of uh, diplomatic relations between Israel and Germany. It's a real reconciliation. And in the middle, you can see the first one in Baku during uh, it's a big one during uh, the, um, uh, the, the conference of intercultural dialogue. They are doing it every two years. Then in Andorra, uh, then, then in, uh, in uh, Tel Aviv in Kfar Makabaya, which is an international place for, uh, for international um, a, a chapter for uh, sports. Then in, uh, uh, you have one in uh, Strasbourg. And downstairs, I hope the lady from Greece will be there. She can hear, can join us, because this is something which is really very, very important for me. Uh, it was inaugurated three years ago, a big sculpture just in front of the Museum of War. And this sculpture, the Tree of Peace, was inaugurated by um, the President of Republic. And then we decided since then, uh, with my colleague, uh, Madame Bardino Yanis, which is, um, a goodwill ambassador as well, to, to build and to create the road to peace all over the world. What does it mean? It means that all the countries that are going to have the tree of peace, that they're having and are going to have the tree of peace, they are going all connected for the same language and for the same desire for peace. It's going to be an exchange because in every sculpture you have a little plaque you have and people will understand what is about and it's a way to talk about peace to dream about peace and to make the things happening because this is happening 
you know, it's something which you're, it's real. You don't talk about it because you are doing it. And the other one is um, uh, in, um, in uh, uh, I'm sorry, in Luxembourg, it was, uh, it was the Minister of Defense who wanted to put the sculpture in the entrance of Strasbourg. And the two last ones was one in September. No, you don't have it here. So I, I gave you the wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. But the last one is in, in Paris, just in front of the Mary of the 16th arrondissement. And there's another one which was inaugurated in September, the 5th of September. It's in Agno, uh, each city which is just on the border, near the border, German border. And it was for the 10 years of uh, celebrating 10 years of the exchange of uh, interface dialogue and 200 years of the synagogue. So the, the uh, this, uh, this tree of peace, I think, and the road of peace that I'm working now with UNESCO, it's something which for me, it's very important because it's not only a bronze tree, a bronze, but it's made by a tree made by bronze, but it is something which has a meaning, which is connecting, which is speaking about peace and celebrating peace. So I hope we will continue on and with this more of them to be more connected to peace and to all, all together to work for peace. And this is a really, uh, this way, it's a language for cultural diplomacy because between my work with my artists, between my sculptures, it meaning cultural diplomacy, and also uh, with some others project that I'm, I'm the godmother of um, uh, an association of UNESCO of um, of children that um, uh, it's a, a a children the name is odyssey and that working about the patrimony and mes the patrimony the celebrating the heritage of uh, uh, the heritage of uh, 200 schools all over the world and the children are exchanging between them talking about the heritage the children are also learning about through the tree of peace about peace. So it's something which is also for education, my tree of peace. And we have many projects of exchange. So all these three projects that I'm working, uh, the, the bronzes, the, the bronze, the sculptures, the art camp, my project, and also Odyssey project. This is a real language and a real exercise of culture diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you, Edva. This is uh, beautiful. As I, as I always say, your, your message is uh, simple, but yet so powerful. So true art is uh, really um, a language of peace. Thank you. So, but now I am, I'm going to Jeremy, um, Jeremy Alamazzani Isomu. <laughs> Good evening. How are you? Extremely well. What about you? <laughs> Very well. Thank you. I, I would like to introduce you, Jeremy before saying who you are, uh, through one of your favorite sentences, if I may say so, uh, that I, I adore. This life is not a rehearsal. It's about economics ahead of color. Fear is not the strategy. Welcome, Jeremy. <laughs> Thank you. As, as I said, you know, I, I, I found it beautiful because also you, you say that your five key words are faith, family, business, community, and legacy. And through your wonderful project that we will uh, hear and listen in a couple of minutes, I, I was introduced by Francois uh, to you and I, I thought you would be an amazing speaker in this art talk. So welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, Jeremy, you are uh, so you're CEO of Square Rock Group and uh, principal at Well Partners a development focused vehicle for uh, African projects and investments. But most of all, you're doing an amazing project for the African heritage. Could you tell us a bit more about the um, path or would you like us to, to, to put the video on now? I think it will be good uh, to, to put the video. It's short, it's less than one minute 30. And yes. Let's go for it first. 
Yes, one. My name is Yvonne Chakataka, and I'm so proud to be Goodwill Ambassador of the Pan African Heritage World Museum. It is time for the world to learn from the missing pages of Africa's history, art, culture, and indigenous knowledge. Join Africa to exhibit and curate her rich herbal plant farms, her historic places of African kingdoms, her beautifully sculpted park of heroes and heroines, Pan-Africa's hidden innovators and inventors, and her literary giants and creatives, all in one 10-acre space of the Pan-African heritage city in Ghana, Winnebar Junction, 45 kilometers west of Accra. There will be hotels there, the chalets, apartments, and other social amenities. So all you do you just register to be a partner, a lifetime member, or ordinary member. Visit our website on www.pahw.org. Let's together build a new humanity through walls of the Pan-African Heritage World Museum. So, Jeremy, could you tell us a bit more the insight and why you were inspired to to create, to, you know, to support such an such a a project? Yes, completely. Um, when it comes to money, to raise money, to define a, a strategy, to deliver, usually there are a lot of people who come to our to our businesses because we know how to do it. And I'm French, but uh, from African origin, from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I just think that it has been for too long time, uh, for too long time, Africa has let other people to make the narrative about its own history, about its own past, and about what could be expected to be its own future. So when I was contacted by uh, the Ghanaian responsible and authorities, and also had a conversation with Kojo, Yanka, which is the chairman and the founder of that museum, and he explained what he wanted to do, which is basically to have on a sort of university campus mm -hmm. uh, on 10 acre field, he wanted to have a museum, the biggest of all African history, from pre-slave trade, which about 1500 to the Portuguese, until now African hero, plants, contributions, scientists, doctor and others. And obviously to have that happen, money was needed. It, it just hit my heart, A, based on the concept, uh, the timeline, because the virtual launch is going to be the 5th of May and the physical delivery has to be the 20, uh, in uh, February, 2023. So all this excited the imagination, my imagination and one of my team to see how to make it happen, how to bring partner. But the most important thing is that uh, as an African, I grew up with Western art, Western superhero, so the Batman, the Superman, or on the other way, could it be the Picasso, the Van Gogh, the Dali? This were my point of reference. When I wanted to see African art and to understand what it was, I had to go to Western Museum in Belgium, in Kerguelen, or in the Louvre, whatsoever. And I was like, hang on. All those countries are developing themselves with our own history and our own, own patrimony. When are we going to have ownership of our contribution to the humanity? And when are we going to have those people traveling in the African land to see a place which is going to be a testimony of who we are, what we stand for, how we have contributed to the planet, and how we can make a difference? Because if you look at history, Africa has been the cradle of humanity. And if you look at the modern time, Africa will be the future of humanity, A, because we even start to talk about nature, carbon emission, the forest is there. When you start to look at the workforce, the youth population, Africa will lead. When you look at everything, which is technology, technology for telecommunication or green energy with the cobalt, oh, again, Africa got the solution. So Africa has the solution for the future. So I think now a lot of time, um, uh, art is perceived as a sort of a soft uh, diplomacy and another way to communicate it. For me, I just thought that to give value to the African art and African patrimony was a way as well to bring a value to the world about who we are. 
if people are told the numbers of invention they are using today, which have been made by African, they will never believe it. Why? Because we have left again other people telling our own story. And this is why uh, for us to bring that museum, that campus of African history alive, it's extremely, it's extremely important. And what I've always been fascinated is by, it's everything which is non-verbal communication, which brings people together. Uh, I remember when I was uh, young, I was sitting uh, at a football game uh, with a young chap who was not speaking French, uh, but it happened that we were supporting the same team and we were having the same emotional reaction every time our team was on a verge to score or every time our team was closer uh, to have a goal against them. And therefore I started to think everything which brings people together, could it be art, could it be sports, could it be food, could it be music, must be nurtured. Uh, Edva showed a wonderful piece before. I think wherever people are, they don't know her name, they don't know her nationality, they react to it because it's speak, it communicated to them. And uh, for my team and myself, to make sure that we raise the few millions to make this museum happen, uh, it's extremely important. But what is extremely important for us is really to state again the place Africa and African art, art has had in the history of the world we live. And the last thing I want to say, because I think it's pretty important for all my colleagues to have their fair share of time as well, is we live in a modern world where a lot of things are, are branded. What I mean by that, the things that have been existing for centuries, but in the modern marketing world, they put a name of it and they try to make you believe that it has been created now or 10 or 15 years ago. But when we're talking about soft power or cultural diplomacy, if you go to see the Queen of Sheba who went to visit uh, the King Solomon uh, based on the Bible with all her gifts, all her presents in order to start a discussion in a good way and to connect with him in a good way, it was already cultural diplomacy a couple of thousand of thousands of centuries ago. So I do think certain times we tend to, to hide a certain numbers of terms of things which have been existing for quite a long time. And the only thing I can say to people is try to travel, try to travel to the Pan-African Heritage World Museum, try to spend a time there and try to assess the contribution Africa and African art and African historians have had on the world. And obviously people are going to have my detail, the detail of the company, feel free to ask questions because we are more reactive when you ask questions than when I speak. So this is what I have to say, and thank you for giving me this time to say it. Jeremy, thank you. Can thank I say you. something? I'm sorry. Yes, of course. I'm sorry, because I didn't know that our friend is going to talk about the Pan-African Museum, but I just want to, to clear something. I'm, I'm on the honorary, uh, I'm on the committee of Pan-African Museum for Heritage in Ghana. Is it the same museum? Uh, you're working with uh, my friend Kojo Yanka. With right? Kojo Yana, yes, with him. <laughs> yeah, obviously, yes. It's the same with them? I'm supporting you. And wow. <laughs> my team and myself are working to bring in the money for this to exist. Oh, no, I am so happy to meet you. I, you this is an coincidence. I was shocked. I asked my friend in uh, the t a friend I, I called now when you were it's, talking is it the same museum is it not another museum I was shocked and it's, it's, it's Kojo Yanka Pan-African so I'm I'm on the board just to tell you yes. <laughs> Edward this is not a coincidence it's the art talks <laughs> yeah. bravo bravo for your gathering the people that in four yes. that really unbelievable and I'm yes. helping them with UNESCO because you know at UNESCO it's priority Africa and we are doing many things for Africa and they and and I will help for the museum you know in uh, to give more audience audience at UNESCO we will talk we'll talk lovely we'll exchange a telephone and we'll talk fantastic you're already on the chat uh, Edba but uh, as 
<laughs> yes, I think, you know, we all be, we will be there in Ghana. I think we are inviting ourselves, uh, Jeremy and Edva. <laughs> So, but I, I just want to conclude, uh, Jeremy, thank you. Thank you so much, because I think also the, the statement of uh, the African Heritage Museum is, is what we all want to hear, a new humanity, racial justice, freedom for all, and respect for each other, which is something so simple, but it seems the world always seems to forget. <laughs> so thank you, Jeremy. You're welcome. People can only respect you if mm -hmm. they can connect with you and know you and it yes. can be through art to create that connectivity to bring respect amongst people then so be it and this sort of program you are doing is helping that as well so thanks to you for doing this thank you for being here thank you so thank you again and now we are but we will come back we will come back to this uh, incredible dialogue that we started and uh, we are going to the wonderful Joanna Kutmine Karavayev, very suwo, sorry because <laughs> very difficult last name. Hello, Joanna, how are you? Hello, Carolina, I am fine. Thank you for inviting me. I hope you are well too. So happy to have you, Joanna, because um, as, I, as I said, I met you to the G100 uh, leader from Vina, uh, Uni Krishnan, and um, and I was fascinated with all the work and the, 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 the wonderful knowledge that you have about the cultural strategy. So when I thought about the culture, uh, this talk, I thought of you straight away. And I would love to hear all your amazing because you have been in this uh, more than 20 years, you've been uh, studying and, and working for uh, cultural public affairs. Could you tell us a bit more, Joanna? Yes, sure. Well, the thing is, I've actually mostly been working. You see, I, from the very start, I was actually trained as an actor. Um, but oh. then I moved quickly into other things and I moved into cultural uh, management and intercultural projects. And uh, I got the passion for creating awareness uh, between countries through culture and art projects. And then I've done a lot, a lot of things. I've coordinated cultural networks. I managed large scale projects. And in the last years, I, I focus on two areas. Um, one of them is creative economy development with an emphasis on uh, the skills that the art and uh, design professions have and how that can be transferred and also exchange, of course, because it's a two way street with the corporate sector. Um, so we are so I'm soon publishing a report on that area. And then, uh, well, I'm, I'm passionate about culture in the context of international relations and um, how it can benefit uh, the largest um, audience. So I actually very um, late in life wrote a master thesis about that a couple of years ago. So um, I would like to, what I would like to say and share today, first, uh, coming back to what the topic is, I would just like to share a couple of words uh, on why I think culture diplomacy can be a, a tricky business. Um, and then I would like to just um, share with you a project that I worked on with the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Colombia uh, a, a while ago. So, um, Sorry, Carolina, did you have something else to say before I start or maybe no, what no, you wanted to know? I'm, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I think that first of all, I, I want to say underline that um, it is complicated culture diplomacy because of, of several things. But I think that one of the main thing is a definition issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cultural diplomacy today is a term that is used for so many things. It's so widely used. So that means that we need, of course, an, uh, a niche definition for each context that we talk about uh, it. And um, I think also today that the cultural diplomacy still has uh, problems to make itself relevant. And relevant in what way then you can maybe ask. And uh, I think that one way is that, one problem is that many governments and government officials, especially through embassies, um, they are not at all uh, experts in culture, thus they don't understand, uh, you know, how to engage in the art and with the art, and they don't always do it in a way that is sustainable, in ways that uh, really benefit art and culture professionals on the sector's development. 
And uh, at its worst, uh, culture diplomacy uh, still attempts just to be purely showcasing, you know, uh, showcasing a country through culture. Um, and uh, also, you know, there are many examples on how you can see it just working as scenography and backdrop for the real diplomacy, so to speak, and the real diplomatic relations to happen. Um, and um, academically, uh, it is no either no no agreement on on uh, what it actually is. You know, you can see a lot of 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 of, of definitions going in the same um, direction: interest driven governmental practice, uh, and also uh, cultural being a tool to advance. You know, the the race in international affairs and international relations to soft power. And I wanted just to, to, to share um, an example, uh, just to give one idea about the diversity of opinions uh, among diplomats on, on this topic. Um, there is a study called the Art of Soft Power, um, where they asked uh, diplomats from various different countries working at the UN office in Geneva uh, about what cultural diplomacy is. And they got no less than 150 different opinions and ideas about what it is. So of course uh, there is no consensus and there's no consensus in what it seeks to achieve either. Um, there are definitions in that study, there were definitions that could be all from battle for hearts and minds, uh, a means for gaining competitive advantage, a way to build national identity, to prevent wars and tackling climate change. So there are many things there that of course are more relevant mm -hmm. from my point of view than others. Um, when I did my research a couple of years ago, I spoke to a diplomat from, uh, it was from Flanders here in Belgium. And uh, he said something interesting. He said that, you know, when you ask someone to define, for example, economic diplomacy, they would say diplomatic initiatives that help the economic development of the country. And uh, when you uh, ask someone what academic diplomacy is, the answer you would get that it would be diplomatic relations aimed at developing exchanges and cooperation between universities and reinforcement of their network. So in both of those cases, of course, the diplomacy serves these other purposes, economy and academy, acad acad academia and education. Um, whereas in the cultural field and in terms of cultural diplomacy, it's often the other way around. How do you use culture to support the objectives of foreign relations uh, policy? So um, I think that most cultural diplomacy initiatives, when we really talk about academia, uh, academic definition of cultural diplomacy, from state actors and governments, this is really mostly about standing out and about, about gaining terrain and, and, and power, which is um, for me not very interesting. And I think it's quite counterproductive because I don't, uh, uh, I do absolutely not think that it helps or what they want it to help with. Um, so of course there are other kinds of practices and uh, it's just a question, what do you call them? What do you call what you do? Um, I have not at all mentioned cultural relations um, yet, which would be maybe more about reaching out and collaboration. So also maybe more in the kind of, of, of uh, cultural practice in the international field that uh, I would advocate for surely and definitely more also beneficial for culture and creative sector professionals, for artists and also for the sector's development. Um, and having said that, I would just mention a couple of uh, things about this um, experience, uh, the work that I did with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Colombia. This was through the embassy in Brussels, and it was a great opportunity to actually do something with the government that aimed at working with and for communities through art and culture. Um, this project became bilateral uh, as it had uh, involvement both from Belgian and uh, Colombian public authorities and governments. So we started that project then um, in a way that um, 
uh, we wanted to see what, what was actually important in terms of pressing, pressing issues for these two countries, and especially for these two cities, Brussels and Bogota, where we judged that we were able to implement uh, what we were going to do. So then we also looked at artistic uh, disciplines, what could be relevant and interesting to work with in these contexts and in these two uh, places and countries. And uh, we defined, uh, we had also, of course, we had also already said that we wanted to work with young people uh, because then it was easier as well to come to the conclusion which we, which we came to that illustration and comics and, and comic strips were the, we found that that would be the best option finally for an artistic disciplines. So uh, that's what we did. And then we talked about the, the topics. So as you may know, have heard, Molenbeek, so Molenbeek in, in Brussels and um, Ciudad Boulevard in, in Bogota, Colombia. These are two neighborhoods um, with both similarities and differences. And these uh, inhabitants, they struggle with uh, different stigma. So we concluded that we work on stigmatization. Um, Ciudad Boulevard, just to say a couple of words about these neighborhoods, is a high, really high risk area of recruitment to armed groups. Um, it has a lot of problems with drug trafficking. The crime statistics are really high in comparison to other neighborhoods in and around Bogota. And uh, the perception of safety is really among the worst uh, in its uh, one of Bogota's poorest neighborhoods. And um, as you uh, may recall, um, Molenbeek has faced challenges uh, after the terror attacks in Brussels and Paris some years ago when it was a, when they did the cure that the, um, these attacks had links back to this neighborhood. So um, we worked with these youth groups sharing these similar issues with stigma. And we try to offer them a context of opportunity and uh, or collaboration to reflect on these stigmas and, and exchange about it. So I just wanted now to share you a couple of images to explain a bit more about that. Let's see if this works. Do you see my screen? Can Yeah, you can see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Um, so yeah, so that's a front page of the magazine. So this this magazine uh, work was named Caro uh, Seyu Pilefas, which is like flip the coin. It was named by one of the, uh, there were young, uh, young, older children, young teenagers who participated. Um, and uh, it's a scene from when the illustrators were working um, with us um, in Bogota, uh, yeah, in the beginning of the project. So these, we were thinking, we were asking a lot of questions, like how could these young groups uh, relate to one another? Um, how could, uh, you know, were they facing stigmatization in the same way? Um, could there be universally identified uh, problems and would they have also universal solutions that to be created together? Could there be a joint narrative created by the groups? Um, how did they see themselves actually and their place in the world? So they worked with the illustrators and in a series of workshops. And of course it was project-based work, which was of course in the context of culture diplomacy in the embassies was very different to something that they were, uh, you know, to what they were used to normally. Um, so I will show you here the next image. Um, so, we here they were asked this uh, question as you see there how do i think people see my neighborhood in molenbeek this is just an example from the magazine so as you can see there is a lot of violence uh, violence and um a lot of or maybe cliches um the next image here um is about how do i think that my neighborhood is like, what do I believe it's like in my neighborhood? Which is of course quite uh, different, quite peaceful really, um, and joyful with a lot of color. 
Um, this last image here that I wanted to show you is the first image is drawn by a uh, young participant in Molenbeek about how he imagined it is in uh, Ciudad Boulevard in Colombia, and the second image, vice versa, how one participant from Ciudad Boulevard thinks it's in Molenbeek. And the interesting thing was that they knew very, very little about each other's um, uh, neighborhoods. The only thing that came out was that that the uh, first uh, image, uh, the, the, per, the, the young uh, boy who drew this first image, he had seen Narcos on, 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 uh, on the internet. So he uh, had seen about drug trafficking and arms and, and violence. And this other boy actually who draw this other image, now there's not an arm or a gun on that one, but the only thing he had actually happened to see about uh, Brussels, that was Brussels, was that um, episode, there were ep excerpts about the terror attacks. So he got inspired um, by that. So, um, I just wanted to share those because I think that images makes things uh, very clear and I think it's it's you know images are very strong to to show something so um, the, the the work that we did in this project I think it, you know it's always it was by far from ideal and there's so much more that we would like to have done but what it did it was that it produced um, a base of opportunity for raising awareness among these young persons on how they're actually impacted by public discourse and stigmatization when they are creating their own identities and personalities. So it opened opportunity for them as well to present this, um, these stories to the public. And uh, the material uh, is now used uh, mostly in Colombia, but in both cases to, to raise awareness on the topic among uh, their uh, in the community. So in this project, cultural diplomacy, of course, went far behind the, the elite level of, an, uh, of lever environments um, that you can often see it happening and uh, really working with people and trying to, 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 to establish some kind of, of change and uh, forward something in the society. So the next actually step that we uh, concluded would be logic was to do it on a very much larger scale and leverage this experience for a larger uh, audience. So it could be, for example, an online international toolkit for helping youth to deal with and engage around stigma. Um, and so to finalize, um, I maybe just wanted to say that, of course, this is not the only way to do culture diplomacy. There is no right or wrong way to do culture diplomacy. There are only very different countries and uh, realities and different socioeconomic contexts. Um, but I surely believe that there are more and less, less relevant ways of doing it. And uh, one relevant way is, of course, always to um, uh, work with artists and professionals and, you know, to always respect their work and that they should always be paid correctly for what they're doing. Um, and I also think that, you know, it's possible to take into account the interest of all kinds of stakeholders, culture and art professionals, uh, the sector's development, civil society, and also government agenda. And uh, I think it's really this kind of, 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 of practice that has the most potential to actually even further account country's images, uh, a country images, because the natural creation somehow of ambassadors and belief and trust in the country, uh, in what it's doing for its citizens and for its society, so to drive positive change, basically. So, yeah, that was what I had to tell you today. Thank you, Joanna. I think is uh, it is absolutely right. There is no right or wrong in in cultural diplomacy, but you you show us also a different way how how you know to connect to to the people that and to the children which are our future and uh, this is beautiful thank you thank you joanna so i i will uh, pass it now to to uh, professor arifon Origi arifon hello you have yes yes good I'm evening i'm here good evening. And um, so uh, Olivier Arifon is a professor, consultant, and researcher. 
and uh, in influence in public affairs, public diplomacy, soft power, and narration for cross-cultural communication. Good evening and welcome to the Art Talks. Okay, thank you. Um, I will present you uh, another side of the count of the another side of the coin of branding uh, through uh, some uh, first academic uh, perspective and then through two cases, two case studies I will present. So okay. I will share my screen now, and I hope I think it's it's okay. Yes, it is. We I put it full screen. That's okay. Okay, it's here. So uh, you have the full screen. Yes. Okay. My 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 goal today is uh, to speak about uh, cultural diplomacy within public diplomacy, and to discuss about the question of uh, attraction through uh, through sorry the, the, for the spelling through resources, and I I as I just introduced the other side of the coin of only branding. Uh, what uh, what can can we start? I can start with a, with that. Um, how a country can transform an asset into a public diplomacy operations operations. That's uh, the, the 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 big trend of many countries today. Uh, they try to create a positive image to attract different elements, the attention of the country, or to gain some positive credits such as image or other kind of resources. And on the left, you see uh, my last book, but in French, Le Récit Politique Chinois. And of course, you see the panda on the cover because uh, concerning China, we may consider that uh, uh, the panda is one resources which can be, which can be framed into a bigger uh, public diplomacy operation, exactly as the Chinese have decided to do. Uh, then uh, this uh, raised a question about uh, different uh, angles that it was said before. Uh, according to me, uh, public diplomacy combined different elements or different combined different uh, uh, definitions. And according to uh, MFA logic, Ministry of Foreign Affairs logic, it can be soft power, the capacity of attraction. It could be cultural diplomacy using culture for diplomatic, diplomatic exchanges. It could be cultural relation, also it could be digital diplomacy, digital diplomacy, which is another two. And on the on the on the on the we have the cover of the one of the many indexes which evaluates as a ranking of soft power of many countries. But uh, as it was said, uh, we may we may combine this tool, and it's it's quite interesting to combine the different elements. Business diplomacy to make to, to sales um, uh, element considering um, um, a trade, cultural diplomacy, academic diplomacy, gastro diplomacy, and sport diplomacy. And in one week, we will say we will see a big event, uh, the Winter Olympic Games, which can, which can be considered by some people by as a sport diplomacy. Now we'll focus on one case study after this uh, global introduction about gastro diplomacy. So maybe you have heard about Good France or Good France. Uh, Good France is a, a public diplomacy operation organ organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of France, uh, combining cultural value and French gastronomy. And it's quite interesting because it's not uh, freezing one culture is not taking one one element and to be, to put a brand onto it to promote it. It's a combined operation uh, only uh, based on one assets. What does it mean? It means that every 16 of April there is many restaurants which offer a menu according to French cuisine. So it's based on the international cultural heritage by the UNESCO. And it's called Le Repas Gastronomique des Français. So it was done about the presidential request in 2008, and we, we will pass to it. And one point important is that the French is using this uh, inscription at the UNESCO to organize one day event per year. And one day per year, registered restaurant propose a menu inspired by French savoir faire. I go very rapidly into details. Of course, there is French cuisine, French food, but also uh, me, uh, digital media and a lot of coverage in many countries in the world. So 
Can we say that going one day into a restaurant for French food is a, is a, is a capacity of public diplomacy or soft power? No. We can we have the answer uh, we have the answer on the next slides. There is a four targets for four audiences. First, the tourists, because you know France is the second most visiting country in the, in the world after the US. 89 millions of tourists in 2019. 30% with gastronomic motivations. So that it means if people are exposed in one day in their own country, in Switzerland or Brazil or in Ghana, they can be uh, have a better connection with the French, French uh, tourist tour with gastronomic motivation. But it's not only that for, for tourists who spend money on the local place, uh, for visiting museums, for example, it's also for professionals with a very special fair. You see on, on the right, Paris Food, Food Forum. It's a, it's a strategy to put France on the map. So, uh, of course, uh, um, this country can propose a, a professional event to gather professionals to exchange knowledge. Then we have the third dimension because, of course, French embassy organized a dinner for qualified, guy, for qualified guy, guests. And I was high school, uh, I was high education attaché uh, for several years, for some years. And I can have on, on, the, on this table a guest, which can be the president of, every, uh, 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 of one university in order to increase my network. So it's another, another dimension of the tool. And of course, for, for, for internal motivation, uh, there is a French audience through a ded dedicated week for health and identity issue. I don't have time to go into detail, but it's a co, all these events are co-constructed. What does that mean? It's not only promotion, branding, and marketing. It's putting different types of actors working together for making a, an event which is, which is support, supposed and which is a uh, uh, friend in order to elaborate relations and link with link, some links with the country. Strong links, soft links, but it could be attractive links. I go, I go, yeah, I go a little bit on, in details. And then we've got even a local dimension. Maybe you know Dijon, the French capital uh, for, uh, for one of the famous capital for wine and gastronomy. Uh, in, in Dijon, uh, there was two tours, which is a city international of gastronomy and wine, which, were, which we build over there. And there is also the, 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 win, the city win a call for tender for, to, to host the Office International du Vin et de la Vigne. So it will uh, put uh, Dijon as a hub for gastronomy and wine, which is quite logic. But we've got an umbrella, and this umbrella is a UNESCO heritage and the UNESCO uh, uh, inscription and the, gas, the good France operation. So it's linked between one restaurant in Ghana or in Brazil, one even in Paris, and one uh, museum and organ international organization in Dijon. So for me, it's a very interesting uh, uh, operation because it's not freezing the culture. It's not branding and resuming one country to one spot, but it's creating some co-organized events in order to, to develop cultural diplomacy or art diplomacy, or in that case, gastro diplomacy. Well, now we have time to go to the second example, which is a little bit shorter. It's about presence Switzerland. So I know there is a Swiss, some people from the Swiss audience in that place. And you know, presence Switzerland is what? Is a very organized uh, unit of the MFA of Switzerland in order to elaborate the image abroad. So this is a, a department. We will, we will not go into that. Everything is online on PDF version. But of course, they work on their cliche. What are the cliche of Swiss? the banks and the secrecy, the mountains, the chocolate, the watches, and the Swiss army knife. Okay, we go into plus democracy and quality of education plus peace. So we've got some cliche and some element of the Swiss image. And as usual, uh, uh, 
According to that, they have their, their resources and they try to move, or not, they try to, to make them slowly change it. So that case is not devoted with really cultural diplomacy, it's more about tourism. But I propose to see, uh, after the, the small video on the, on the museum in Ghana, I pro propose to see the, the, the small video, one minute and 30 minutes, uh, concerning uh, uh, this, uh, these two guys, Mr. Federer, Federer and the Miro. So I, I don't, I'm not sure about the connection. Uh, does it work? What do you see now? Ah, ha, ha. This is always a problem with with the video. Which yes, is, the, not yet. You don't see the video yet, right? It's not opening. That's a problem with the, with the PowerPoint and the video. Always the same problem for me. Okay. Yeah, be patient. We can breathe. We, we, we are patient. Don't worry. We are, we are just one. Uh, I think I am uh, one uh, thinking of the beautiful French food at the moment. <laughs> Which you're also like... thinking of the beautiful uh, uh, um, uh, mountains, no? Well, we are already here, so I think <laughs> my my desire was going to a different. Oh, so here we are. To what we can't have. So, Who? sorry, is that the end of the video? There's always the same problem with my computer. <laughs> so we have time to to see uh, the, the whole video, and uh, what I want to say, it's a working on cliche. But it's a very subtle work on cliché because that's, uh, I, I, I phrase it as a three styles, quality, money, and clarity of the message, which is very important. So let's look at this, this video. Hey, oh, how are you doing? Hey, Roger, how are you? I'm just relaxing in the Swiss Alps. Take a look. Yeah, it's good. Good. Good for you. Listen, about the Switzerland film you want me to do? Yes. Did you see the boot film I sent you? I'm watching it as we speak. I don't like it. What? Just look at where you are, Roger. I mean, you've got your mountains, your skiing resorts, your charming little towns, green valleys. There's no drama. No drama at all. Seriously? But did you see the bits with the sunset? Roger, from a certain type of actor, I need an edge, conflict, jeopardy. Switzerland is just too perfect. Yeah, I guess you're right. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You guys are too nice. You should have said, fuck you. Okay, listen, how about the two of us on this special mission? We ski down the slope. What, skiing down the slope together? We go even skydiving, come on. Then we land on these fields and the cows are grassing. Roger. I have to be honest with you. It's not happening. Ah. Sorry, Roger. Maybe call Hanks. Who? <laughs> voilà. For me, it's a perfect work on what? Not on tourism, not on marketing, but mo on two elements. And I go back to my PowerPoint to do the conclusion. It's a perfect work to, to, to work on, on, uh, 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 on cliches, on storytelling, and how to try to move uh, a, little, a little bit more uh, the image uh, of one country, Rely, rely, relying on that case on some, on some uh, resources and assets, as I mentioned in the introduction. And to finish on that, each country has different assets. Each country has different resources. Each country has different qualities. So that's a strategy of one MFA, of one tourist organization, of one cultural uh, uh, unit to, to use or to uh, organize this in order to uh, contribute to the image, according to my, to my point of view, because I'm working on public diplomacy since 10 years. And I, I conclude with that. <clears throat> public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, and art because of course you see uh, uh, another um, um, uh, ranking uh, elaborated by the uh, private company called Brand Finance. And on, on the, the screen is a little bit um, um, 
crushed, but you see uh, all the country which are ranked according to 17 items, which is uh, the big tendency today to, to elaborate rankings and to create indexes. But uh, I want to emphasize on country try to different, to different themselves, country try to create positive images, which may, which may, which not should, but which may conduct to positive comments and perceptions, then how it goes today. Okay, I was very happy to present this to you. I'm done. Are you here? Hello? Yeah. I'm here. I'm down. Oh, we're still down. It's Carolina who is uh, muted right now. Oh, okay. That's the reason we're all waiting for her to come back in the game. But, but I have uh, I, uh, my, my presentation is over. So is, the host, is the host who is missing? What's the problem? So I, I'm, as you had the PowerPoint problem today, it seems all the computers are going a bit uh, crazy. No, I'm here. I'm back. I, I don't see. Get, I don't see anyone on my screen. I, I couldn't get in my in my Zoom. Sorry. No, you are still on your computer. I think. Is this me, yours? Me. Uh, I'm still on my computer, but I have finished my I, I, my my presentation is over. Yes, yes, and we. I'm here. Can you see me? But you have to switch off. I think that's why you can't see any of us. So my presentation is over, and my conclusion, I, my conclusion is done. <laughs> I we. I have to say, Olivier, I I loved your 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 you know your videos, and they made us think. You know the cliche, and the, you know how the branding and. This is all cultural diplomacy. I live in Switzerland, so I could see the uh, Robert De Niro <laughs> fact that there is it is it is too perfect, and uh, but for other people it is absolutely a paradise. But um, I, I love it. But we are still on your on your uh, PowerPoint. I think Olivier, you have to switch it off so we can see all the others. Yeah. And here, ah, yes, okay, yes. okay, okay, I forgot this, I forgot this, I'm sorry. It, it wasn't me. Stop. I'm sorry for that, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> so I, I I, think it was it was wonderful. So, you know, this is also the art talks. Sometimes things happen and I couldn't get in, in my Zoom. <laughs> okay. I always forget to, 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 share, to stop. Don't worry, sharing. Olivier. But, but I, I, hope, think... I hope my, 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 my message and my content was, uh, was clear. It was. I think it was. It was wonderful. I think it. It made us, you know, open our minds in a different. Uh, you know, we are all set into the art, but it is all connected. And I think we come back to what Jeremy said: to to connect to people, we have to find the same. It doesn't mean, a, a, you know, very simple things: food, sport, all the things that people can connect or, or more. But thank you, Olivier. So I, I'm going to uh, just have a give word for a few minutes to Lisa Russell that I met, you know, we met through the G100 also today. And uh, Lisa, you, you are, uh, your passion is, is, uh, is, is incredible. So uh, you are a filmmaker, academic, different me things, 20 years intersection of arts, social justice, a sustainable development. So could you tell us in five minutes? <laughs> sure. Everybody leaves us. <laughs> I talk fast, so it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Lisa Russell. I'm an Emmy award-winning filmmaker and I, I'm a new screenwriter. And I didn't go to film school, nor did I start my career as a filmmaker. I got my master's in international public health and landed my first job in Kosovo and Albania in 1999 and was, uh, hit very, very hard with the, the reality that storytelling in the sort of global health and development space uh, was very um, harmful. The narratives that were put, being put out about women in particular were very harmful and one dimensional. And so when these women were saying we're unhappy with the journalists who are coming in and basically wanting to tell this one story about women being, um, you know, 
uh, victims of rape and that's all the journalists wanted to talk about and they're asking women to raise their hands if they've been raped. It just really kind of shook me to my core of, wow, when I look at the work of the UN and NGO community, we do tell one dimensional stories that are very, very harmful. So I got interested in storytelling and I shifted my whole career path to becoming a filmmaker, but because I have a dance background and I work with poets and a lot of folks, I um, integrated different performing artists into my film work. So I jumped on a bus tour with Zap Mama, for example, and went around screening my films and then had, um, had a musical performance to accompany it. So there's one thing I wanna, um, I wanna say about cultural diplomacy. And then I, if I do have time, I just wanna show a short video just to, to kind of give a visual to it. But um, my role, I think in the cultural diplomacy atmosphere is really in being an advocate for artist led spaces and artist friendly spaces um, in the policy arena, especially as it retain, as it pertains to sustainable development. So let me just give you sort of my quick, quick, like example. Um, I run a network called Create 2030, and we curate performances, and we do workshops, and we do a lot of sort of stuff with working class artists. So these are poets, musicians, beatboxers, dancers, they work in the informal sector, they're not associated with museums or institutions or anything, they're very much community based. And I got a, a, a invitation from the UN Food System Summit to reach out to youth artists to engage in their sort of movement and their big summit. When I attended two of the conferences, I thought, if I try to introduce youth artists to this, I will lose them completely. It was too academic. It was too UNE, which is important. It was very policy oriented, it needed to be. But my feeling is if we create artist friendly spaces, where do artists like to go? They like to go to studios, they like to go to festivals. And if we created spaces in the policy arena for artists to do what they like to do and be in spaces that they like to do, I think we will galvanize a greater involvement of the creative economy into um, policy efforts as partners. We, we have a lot of artists, especially in my network, that are hip hop artists, they're artivists, if you want to call them, they're activists, and they're independent thinkers, critical thinkers, problem solvers, and they're oftentimes not seen as, as the appropriate voices in a a delicate policy environment. But if you allow artists to lead spaces and create spaces, then I think we can invite them in, we can invite policymakers to come in in a safe way to see what their concerns are, what their voices are. And we wouldn't have this, what I feel is like a little bit of tension sometimes between policy and practitioners. Um, and so I just wanna just kind of put that thought out there and then I'm gonna show just a very, very short video um, if it's okay. and then. And um, yeah, I can, we can have a longer talk maybe um, at a different time. So let me just which, share my which, screen. Which we will already, we're going to have <laughs> of yes. March. Invite you everybody for women, 8th of March, Women's Day. Okay. <laughs> Artists maybe. from all over the world. So. Where is it? Okay. So this is a short video. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So it's very short. <clears throat> it is said that the role of the artist is to make revolution irresistible. With the stroke of a brush, a new landscape is seen. A sculpture can reimagine our environment. A photograph can be a tool for justice. Songs can help communities build resilience and films can challenge harmful narratives to build empathy. It's true that artists can move hearts and minds, but we can do so much more. We are one of the world's fastest growing economies. We are incredible creative thinkers and problem solvers. We build new paradigms for cities and drive tourism as cultural workers. We are important communicators during crises and help connect the disconnected. Our livelihoods are independent of a formal work culture. We can be of any age, any ethnicity, and work anywhere in the world. We are not charity, but a growing, thriving economy. Our sector generates more than 29.5 million jobs and $2,250 billion in US revenue. 
Our world is in need of a creative revolution, and yet our livelihoods are at stake. You can help change this trajectory. Create artist-friendly policies. Support the health and well-being of working-class creatives. Give artists a seat at the decision-making tables. Solicit our creative thinking and problem-solving skills. And engage us in creating a sustainable world by 2030. My name is Lisa Russell, and I'm a filmmaker and a curator. As founder of Create 2030, I advocate for responsible engagement of professional artists in the sustainability sector. Let us create a better world together. So I could talk forever, but I'm going to stop there. And <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, Lisa. No, it was, yeah, it was last... Oh, wonderful. sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yes. It was wonderful. No, thank you. Thank you, because I think it's, uh, it's uh, brought us this energy again to, to go out there and, uh, and um, make this world a better, a better world. I, I think, uh, and I thank you so much for, you know, jumping as, as uh, uh, today, which was really an honor for to have you all here. But just before we, we, we go, I would love to know if anyone would like to, I know we went a bit over, over time. Uh, David is already <laughs> seeing, look at me in a, in a bad way. No, I'm joking, yeah, poor David is your, my greatest supporter. So uh, please, if you would like to ask anything, uh, now it's the time before, uh, before we say goodbye. That's just real yes. quick. Yes. Yeah. So, so I think I'm so happy this generated a lot of discussion and, and conversation. And I think where I stand is that um, we need all of these spaces and all of these approaches. But where I think me and my Create 2030 fit in is that we work with a lot of BIPOC artists. So we work with artists who don't normally get a voice in policy spaces. I'd like to just point out there's a young hip hop artist from Uganda who joined the chat. Um, he's, for example, been really excited and does amazing work at the community level. And I think it's when we say artist led spaces, it's ensuring that those folks who aren't normally in the in the circles of influence or who aren't connected to this person or this institution um, find ways to, you know, to come together. And I think we all can work together and bring our own strengths and sort of our own approaches to this. In terms of having artists um, find solutions, this is my big quote, is that we're some of the most creative thinkers and, and greatest problem solvers on the planet. So why wouldn't you want us at a table talking exactly. about solutions to climate change, for exactly. example? Absolutely. And those don't, you know, I do a lot of work at the United Nations headquarters and those don't happen as much as I think that they should. And there's not as much representation at the leadership levels of working class artists. There are high artists, there are people who have established careers and we need them, but we also need people who are very much working class artists with their feet on the ground, uh, struggling and surviving as, as creatives. So that's all I want to add to that. To give quickly uh, to Leshai, that is one of the youngest boys here. She raised her hand respect very long time ago. Leshai, would you like to say something before we say goodbye? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Carolina. I only jumped in um, sort of maybe about 20 minutes, half an hour ago, so I didn't get to hear everyone. But I'm just so excited for everything that's happening, all of these amazing projects, linking in climate change and solving big world problems through creativity, which is how we can fix so many of the issues in the world. Um, but myself as a young creative in the art space and in the entertainment space, I think it's really important that we start to introduce these younger voices into these discussions because sometimes I've been in meetings or environments and there are so many assumptions assumptions about what young people need or how they're feeling or what should change but I found that just introducing a young voice into certain spaces can make a world of difference and um, so it would be amazing to connect with everyone I'm sure I can find 
some of your platforms like LinkedIn and stuff and future I events. Your, uh, that, uh, where we can find you if you want to be tagged and we can, uh, you know, you can exchange it on, on the chat. Thank and and so David, much. on the art talks, you are all connected. You you can see that you can find each other if you are in the art talks. Thank you, Leche. It was Thank beautiful you. to have you with us, and we are going to have more and more. I think we are going to have your your brother in the environmental uh, consciousness talk on the second of uh, February next week. And I just wanted to say thank you to all of you because I think all of you encapsulate what the real ambassador of the art and culture is. And again, thank you for your patience, for being here, uh, Jeremy, <laughs> and Olivier, and uh, Edva, David, Lisa, whoever, Elizabeth, and Russ, Bernard, who I just met today, and uh, Disheka, thank you so much for all the comments, Lachey, and uh, Key X, uh, that I hope, I, I, I don't know the name, but I just thank you all for being us with us and following us um, on the Art Talks.